I live in uh, Ohio. We're about 25 miles southeast of Columbus. I have been no-tilling since 1971. I've been working with cover crops since 1978. We started no-tilling because we had to. We just didn't have time to do tillage. After five years of no-till, we started losing yields. We couldn't go back to tillage because I couldn't afford anything to... I'd spent all my money for the planter and the tractor and nothing left to buy tillage tools. So that's when we began using cover crops to see if we could enhance the yield even more, and it did. For 30 years, I've only worked with one species because I didn't realize we could make two or 10 or 50 or 60 grow until just the last five or six years. The first picture here is what really made me famous, and I made a mistake and went to the NRCS office after I grew radishes and peas together. And that sucker is 42 inches long, six inches in diameter. I do enjoy to talk about it. I'm pleased to be here today. I should be home riding a corn planter. So you can see how important it is for me to come talk about soil health and how to get started. You know, my son's involved with the operation. His wife and, and him takes care of our cover crop seed business. And that's about all we'll say about that for right now because I don't want you to think I'm here to sell cover crops because we're in business. I'm here to show you how important it was for us to continue. And what we did, we started out with rye. You know, rye was simple. You could get a hold of it. It was cheap. It used to be you could buy a bag of rye for four bucks. You know, now it costs you 16 to 20, just because we've made a demand for it. You know, you can sow the rye. Rye has the largest window of application. You can sow rye in August. You can sow rye in December and still get results. Now, the December rye you won't see in the fall, but you will see it in the spring. Here we're planting into some rye. This was about 1978, you know, just as we learned how to do this, you know. Here's uh, what we're doing now. Uh, I like low rates of rye because you have to remember our soils are heavy, glaciated soils. So we have about four and a half foot of hard clay, which is mucky and about four inches of topsoil. And we only own 80 acres, and it's not tiled. And we farm 1,100 other acres that's not tiled. And we can't afford to do tillage to remove the water. So we had to use cover crops to grow the water out of the system. Uh, so we found when we, we went, when we first started, the university says you need to use two bushel of rye. Well, when we go to the field this afternoon, we're going to talk about how thick the cover crop should be. The one we look at this afternoon is twice as thick as it ought to be, you know. And the reason is we'll talk about that. So when we, when we started, we used a two bushel. We had all kind of trouble with equipment. You couldn't get it in the ground. You couldn't cut the residue. You couldn't do things, you know. As we reduced the, the amount of green mass we had, the easier it got to do. So now on our farm, most of our rye is at 30 to 50 pounds. Depends on how it's planted. If we use our 15-inch splitter planter, which is what this is, these are 15-inch rows of rye, that's 22 pounds of rye per acre. Pretty economical. If we use our drill, we're at 35 pounds. If we use our high-boy cedar, we're at 60. Just because the high-boy cedar don't put it in the soil, it blows it out on top of the ground. You know, here we're planting corn, April 28th. When the rye is this short, we have to use some kind of, some way to burn it off or mow it or do something with it take it out. Well, you can raise it too. And you could, yeah, right, and graze it. Just wanted to show you, you can see it's not real thick, the sunlight's still getting down the soil, the wind's getting down the soil, help drying out our clays, you know. Uh, this is an interesting picture. Uh, this is on uh, May the 27th. It had rained two weeks in May, so we didn't get any corn planted. The forefront of this picture here, we took off for silage for the neighbor. My neighbor's got dairy cattle. He's always out of hay come the 1st of March. Can I come get some of your rye hay? And I used to just give it to him because I felt bad. You know, I did that for 10 years. So in 2008, he took about, uh, about 15 acres, and there was about five acres of rye left. So when it got time to plant beans, this was a regrowth. So that was probably about five days of regrowth. And this didn't get harvested as hay leach. And that was the first time we went in and planted like that. I thought, what's going to happen, you know? Well, what happened was, you know, there, there we are, we're planting into it. Now it looks like this. You know, here it is again. This is 2008. These soybeans right here 
made 54 bushel. These soybeans right there made 67 bushel. Guess what? 2009, you got no more rye. <laughs> Learned a viable lesson, you know. But what I'm trying to show you is you can have feed source. There's the round bales, you know, got dry enough to round bale it. So there he's got his feed for his heifers. We're planting corn and beans into this, you know. There's some that had some herbicide burn. We've tried all different ways. I like to plant green, mainly because my weatherman don't get paid enough. You know, he'll tell me that it won't rain for a week, and we'll do this trick right here. And when you burn this down, it's going to, I'll guarantee it will rain two inches the next day. You know, so guess what you got? You got this brown thatch, two inches of water underneath there, no way to get sunlight and wind down through there. So you got a swamp, and a swamp for about 60 days. It just takes that long for that water to percolate through the soil. But if it was green and growing, we could be planting, you know. So my talk is always trying to convince you to to plant green. If it's a weather climate like you might have here, where it's hotter and drier, I'd kill it earlier, you know. There's the results. Six foot high rye with our 15 inch planter. You know, so now we're planting corn with our planter. Now we're planting soybeans with our planter. We plant the cover crop the fall before with a planter. Guess what? Instead of that planter sitting in the shed 10 months out of the year, it's in the field eight months out of the year. Lord, my investment cost. If you look at me, you say that's pretty clean. I thought that was pretty clean. My wife raised cane. She says, those pokeberries out there got to be taken care of. Dad, I said, okay. I went out to the barn, got the hoe, handed it to her and says, thank you very much. <laughs> that was the only herbicide control we had. You know, you can see I don't use a hoe, you know. <laughs> What we're after is the armor. And this is the dead thatch of the rye. And why do we want the armor? We do not want that 20 mile an hour raindrop causing the soil to splash up on the stem. Because what happens when the soil splashes up on the stem or the leaves? It brings up disease. We have white mold problems. We have sudden death problems. So when a raindrop hits the armor that's on the soil, we get no soil splashing. It's tied up the extra nitrogen. You know, soybeans are something like me. They're lazy. So if they don't have to put nodules on and there's free nitrogen, they get big and tall and fat and not very many pods. So you tie up the nitrogen and look how they potted. Each pod is touching each other. Instead of one or two trifoliates on a pod, there's three to five. Those are 72 bushel beans, fellas, and they're only 30 inches tall but the pods are touching each other. Instead of two or three beans, there's four to five beans in a pod, all because of the rye. We see 10 to 12 bushel increases by using rye.